Welcome to I Dare to Live with King, Mind, Body, and Spirit. It is my privilege, my pleasure to have you here this evening as we look at how to improve learning and memory. Let us pray to begin. Our loving, wonderful Father, we thank you for this marvelous body that you have given each of us. You have given us fantastic brains and you want us to use these all for your honor and glory and now as we look at how to improve learning and memory guide us in this discourse and may each person benefit in tremendous ways may the students the teachers parents here and all of us who engage in the study of your word truly benefit and be able to use this information to improve and to memorize your word we give you praise and thanks in the name of jesus amen improve your learning and memory I am your host and presenter, your psychologist, Dr. Melitha St. Hill. Now, what is interesting about this topic is that I did my doctoral dissertation on brain-based learning. So this evening, I'm sharing with you the background, the information that I learned from this and the experiment that I did in schools the outcome and what you can benefit from. Here we have two important terms that we need to look at. The first one is learning. Learning is really the information that we receive and understand. It is information that helps to change our mindset our value system, behaviors, our customs, our habits then, the, the way we do things on a regular basis, and even our skills, whether they be vocational skills or study skills, they may be academic skills, whatever the skill set may be. Learning is that process of acquiring information there is a difference between learning and the other one is memory memory on the other hand is the ability to remember and then later hopefully to recall the information learned so you may learn that one plus one equals two that is information that you got somewhere when you commit it now and you remember one plus one equals two then that is where memory comes in we have here the difference between learning and memory learning is that process of gathering information whereas memory is remembering the information that we learn here we are looking at how to improve both learning and memory. The learning process, it includes the environment, sensory organs, the brainstem and the emotional brain. Now let me explain. In our environment, we have to first of all identify what our environment includes our environment includes for example the songs that i'm experiencing in my background that's the environment the words are spoken let us say i have persons around me the words of either affirmations or words of uh, put downs those are all part of my environment the different color schemes around me that's part of my environment the plant behind me all of these things 
So the environment includes the music, the different songs, the words. It includes the color scheme, whether the, the place, the setting is clean, whether it's well put together. All of those things include the environment. Now, information, we receive this from our environment. In our environment, we learn how to do things. We learn how to talk to people. Yes, in our environment, in our home environment, children learn how to talk back to parents. I, I'm not talking about rude talk, but I'm talking about in terms of communication. We have communication patterns that are learned in our environment. We discussed the environment already, the room, music, sounds, and it can also include distractions, the things that are taking our attention away from what we are trying to learn. Then that information will go to our sensory organs. Now, this is what we need to remember. From our environment, information then goes to our sensory organs and you ask so what are your sensory organs especially for the children we have here the sensory organs now these are our eyes our ears my ears are all covered up here our nostrils the mouth and hands the eyes referring to what we see the ears what we hear the nostrils, what we smell, the mouth, what we taste, and the hands, what we touch. It is important for us then to guard what is happening in our environment because what happens there affects our sensory organs. Now, the information from our environment to our eyes, ears, nose, mouth, hands, or the touch, that information travels and goes to the brain stem. Now, that is not so important, really. It is the next stop of the information that is so vital. You may have heard persons talk a lot about the role of emotions in learning. And this is so very important because the next stop of uh, the information that we hear and learn is uh, the emotional part of the brain. Here we have it from the environment to the sensory organs, eyes, nose, uh, ears, and so on, and then to the brainstem, and from there to the emotional brain. Now, the emotional brain is that part of the brain that, first of all, as the term suggests, it controls emotions. Emotions are really our feelings. We can feel happy, sad, excited, motivated, captivated. We have these different positive feelings. And then you have sad, discouraged, despondent. It is important then for us to identify the different emotions that we have when we study. The next thing in this emotional brain, which is from the sides going in here, in the brain, is that the function is hunger and thirst which means that if you are really hungry or thirsty you are dehydrated that is what thirst means thirst does not mean that you need juice but it means that you need water the brain is made up of over 70 percent water Therefore, we need to hydrate the brain. And this thirst signifies dehydration or that the brain needs water. So you have hunger for food and then thirst for water. 
in this part of the brain it deals with these two and it secretes the hormones or chemicals to control them you have leptin and ghrelin the leptin is a that's a hormone that says you're satisfied and ghrelin is that you're hungry and you're ready to ravish and eat down a large plate of food then the other function in this emotional brain is our sleep wake cycles it is important then for us to manage the time we are going to sleep if that information we learned from our environment let us say it is in a classroom whether the classroom is face to face or virtual we are learning information there and that information went from the environment from the words of the teacher to our sensory organs we heard we saw maybe graphic ideas and so on presented we probably tasted if it is a cooking class or we heard other sounds if it is a chemistry or a biology science class we actually put our hands and touched and felt things happening and that information now pass on to our sensory organs then go to the emotional brain there for that brain to work it must have that regulated sleep wake cycle therefore on no occasion should we be sending children to bed later than eight o'clock and when i say children i'm talking about ages 12 and under they should be in bed by eight o'clock to ensure that they get sufficient sleep to consolidate the information they learn during the day and so are able to recall later then there is a, this other important aspect of the emotional brain and that is it controls long-term memory if you want to remember something for the rest of your life then you have to consider all of these other factors to help us to remember for a long time so you have to think about uh, your emotions if your emotions are negative then you're talking about being sad being despondent discouraged you are not going to remember anything really if your emotions are positive and a big yes i can do this by the grace of god and maybe you're happy about some other things that are happening in your lives or just being positive in general what you find is that it is easy now for the things you learn to pass from what was short term to what is now long term memory long term memory is situated in that same emotional brain and the key here is emotional so it's all about feelings we must engage feelings in all that is done in learning what i find especially in our british system in the caribbean is that a lot of emphasis is placed on just passing on information rather than engaging students in emotional learning and also mastery learning before we go any further it's important for us to note that our environment needs to be what is referred to as enriched an enriched environment is where adults whether parents or teachers show care and provide emotional security for the students it is an atmosphere in the classroom or in the study area where there is a care given for each other. 
instead of the desk having one person to a table then you may have four or five gathered together and working with each other so you have your students working with each other and helping the others what i find visiting different schools and this is not only in trinidad and tobago but in other islands and even having done some teaching in the u.s that so much emphasis is placed on the individual student in front of a desk and not encouraging this enriched environment in this enriched environment there is a lot of talking and laughter among the students and teacher of course the teacher is very much involved in this in this way students feel relaxed this emotional brain it is excited it is invigorated and it very subtly encourages the students to remember those things that were taught let me give you an example of what i'm talking about when i taught accounts in secondary school i heard my students calling another student plate well i found that interesting why are they calling natasha plate I asked one of them, why are you calling Natasha plate? The person said to me, it's because her teeth are so perfect that it looks like a plate. I did not say anything after that. I just kept silent. And then I waited for the opportune moment. I was teaching something and discussing among the students. We always had these discussions back and forth and at times i will explain something but uh, there comes a time when the student does a better job at explaining the same thing to a fellow student and so in the process of this learning activity i just looked to natasha and i said plate what do you have to say the whole class was in stitches because they did not know I knew about this nickname they gave Natasha. Now that laughter, it encouraged everybody in the sense that people remembered this emotional experience of laughter, of happiness, and the subject matter that area that principle i was teaching it suddenly opened up before them and everybody understood it just made my job so much easier and the stress of trying to understand was relieved and the students were all happy what i found in the school system across the US and the Caribbean, I found that in the classrooms, students were not given the opportunity to invent different teaching strategies. Too much emphasis is placed on the teacher and the teaching role, and even parents, when children come home with uh, assignments, the focus is on the adult teaching, but not giving the students the opportunity to teach. This is so very important to give students that opportunity. In so doing, the students are able now to explain, and that way they now know for certainty that they have the concept taught and then they can just fly educationally speaking when students are taught everything remains 
short term in the working memory system. You teach information and it's just there for now. By the time you turn your back, everything is gone. Unless you have a method of moving what you taught from short term to long term. And if you are a student studying on your own, the same is true. You have to think in terms of moving the information from your short term to long term. Now, short term is in the part of the brain that is responsible for emotions. It's on top here, the parietal lobes is responsible for some other areas. And the one that I am paying special attention to is handwriting. Today, we encourage students to do a lot of typing from the time they enter into primary or elementary school. And that skill of writing is not used much, but writing is part of that working memory system. So that the more we write while hearing, while seeing, while smelling, tasting, and touching, as in experiencing the information, that is the touch is experiential, then when we write, we are adding to our ability to remember. Information in this short-term memory is soon forgotten, and we can strengthen it by writing more than we are accustomed to. Information must be coded when we are transferring information from short-term to long-term. So we just heard information. We just heard that the emotional brain is important for learning and memory. That's short-term. Now to get that same information to long-term memory, we must code that information. Coding the information looks at a few different areas. I have four different areas that we need to look at in coding. One is acoustic, the sounds that we're hearing. Right now, you should be hearing sounds of waterfall, a guitar playing, now, all the time I was not hearing it. No, I was hearing, I was not listening. But I just stopped for a moment to hear what songs are coming through. We have all these different songs, but here is what. When the information is given to us, we hear the words coming across in different tones. And so we have different songs coming out. An example is if I'm to recite the words, in the heart of Jesus, there is room for you. You may never remember those words until I change my tone and the rate of which I speak as well. And I say it this way now, in the heart of Jesus, there is room room for you. Well, immediately you begin to see, okay, so in the heart of Jesus, there's room for me. You begin to feel differently right away. So the songs affect our feelings. The songs, if it is music going on in the background, like classical music, it affects our emotions, how we feel. They affect the brain waves, encouraging us to be able to learn and remember what we are studying. The next code that is important is visual, visual coding. And this refers to images. Look at it this way. If we are talking about baking a cake, if you look at 
an image as to what this cake should look like in the end, then you are seeing that image. You are coding the information, the ingredients with the image and how it looks. If we are talking about, let us say, a carrot cake, then you are seeing a sort of yellow, orange looking cake in front of you. So you are putting colors, you are putting the shape, whether it's a circular cake or a rectangular cake. You're putting all of that information together and that image helps you to remember what a cake looks like. Maybe you never saw a cake before, but now you know what a cake looks like because you have an image in your mind. What I like to do when I am studying is that I create an image with words. I look at the words, I position them and take a photograph of the words in front of me. Now that is really powerful. It calls for a lot of uh, practice. You are looking at a text. Let us say it is um, Romans chapter 12. It talks about um, presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. But it starts with the words, I beseech you therefore. Now, I will remember all the words on each line because I've taken a photograph. I keep looking at the words and how they are structured there and remember the whole thing based on how it looks in that passage. The same thing we can do and teach our children how to do where rote memory is necessary, where students have to just learn the actual information and not to have to paraphrase or put their own words into the meaning of a term that they are using. Imaging is important whether it is an image of an actual object of words or it can be creating a picture a mental picture of something that is told to us if you're looking at a story you're doing literature in school and you're talking about romeo and juliet you may create an image as to what Romeo looks like and what Juliet looks like and the different scenes that uh, they went through, even without looking at the video of Romeo and Juliet. When you study these things and you look at imaging, it helps so much in terms of learning the information and then remembering. Here we are looking at how we can take things from short term and make them long term. The next code is semantic. Semantic has to do with the meaning of the concept of the idea presented. If you think that this thing, it means that you must get up and move. Let us say the word is exercise. Now, exercise could mean an activity that you have in your classroom, an exercise in your math book, for example. You have exercise one or exercise two. But then, too, you can have exercise which is moving the body. We have to understand in coding what the meaning is, attach the meaning to what you are studying to help to remember. The other code is emotional, and that has, of course, to do with feelings. Think what transpired to help me. And just now I give you that experience with Natasha being referred to as plate. When the students laugh, they remember. And so in terms of 
taken that information and they have encoded it with Natasha, that joke, then it's easy for them to transfer the information to the long-term memory, which is in the hippocampus of the emotional brain. The emotional brain has several parts of which the hippocampus is one of those parts. And it has to do with long-term memory. Strengthen the memory. How do we go about strengthening the memory? To do so, we have to use those same codes, those codes we use, and these codes are our acoustic sounds, the visual images, semantic, the meaning, and the emotional, the feelings. We use those codes to review one and two to rehearse. Review is this. The teacher just gives the information or you just read it from your book or maybe you listen to the audio. These days we have audios and we have videos. So you just listen or you look at the video, heard your teacher teach, you review, you use the sounds, you use images and so on, you write, you may draw, you may do all of those things to review. When it comes to reviewing emotionally, here is where the teacher, the parent, or even a person studying by himself or herself, we can teach our children how to do these things. You can do role plays, you can do monologues, create stories, dramatize, you can use music, you can use a hand clap, write songs, poetry, all of those things using the arts to help, first of all, to understand the information. And as we review, we are able to strengthen that memory process. Then the other thing will be to rehearse or go over. At that time, you will use the same codes to rehearse. Rehearse means you are going over to ensure that you truly know the information that you learned from your environment. You may think that adult students do not need to use some of these coding. And here's where you're wrong. I teach adult students in a master's program. I believe that counseling psychology is a practical course. And all that I'm teaching my students, it should be practical more than theoretical. What I have done up to recently, a few weeks ago in my class, I did a lot of role playing. Have the students role play. One is the counselor or two are the counselors. And then you have two or three are the counselees. When they do that and they role play, the theory that was taught, they are putting all their emotions into it. And even those listening, because at the end, they now have to critique, say what they like and what they did not like or what could have been better or what the counselor forgot to do and that kind of thing. What I found was that these students, they absolutely enjoyed the class. That's one thing, they had fun. And secondly, the theories taught was so much easier for them to remember, even though they did not go home and learn them. What I've found is that in teaching, teachers expect students to go home to learn the information. And that is where this whole learning and memory break down and the students are under so much stress right in the classroom whether face to face or virtual there should be learning there should be information transferred to the short-term memory system 
where the information is just there floating in the emotional brain and then we have to take it to that part of the long-term memory it has to be done right in the classroom not after when the student leaves by that time it's too late it's lost we need to help our students move information straight from the short term to the long term in the teaching process in that teaching period if the period is 40 minutes of uh, teaching then during that time you must have allocated a uh, time for ice breaking a time for teaching the principles and a time for reviewing and rehearsing that information when the student leaves the classroom and goes home that is the time for rehearsing further rehearsal the more the student rehearses now the greater the chances that the student will actually remember what was taught and that long-term memory will be now very solid it is important for both the teacher and student to have a positive attitudes the teacher must be able to say to the students you can and the students must be able to say i can do this subject and will succeed by god's grace let me explain what i mean by this in my doctoral dissertation i did an experiment in two schools one is what we call a prestige school where the brilliant children go and the other school was where the not too brilliant children go they are the lower end the really low end of the educational spectrum when i went the group that i had i looked at them and i saw a lot of dejected students students who did not feel capable of doing anything I was intrigued because I knew something that they did not know. And that was, I went to that same school, but I went at a time when it was not considered as one of the very low end schools. But with time, it changed to that. Now the students did not know that, and that was not important for them to know then. What I told them was, I know that you feel that uh, you are not brilliant and that you cannot make it. Let me see the hands of all of you who think that way. The whole class, everybody's hand went up. Now, how do you work with students who do not feel positive about themselves and their ability to learn? Well, right away, I give them my famous pep talk that, yes, you can do it. I was a student in this school and I have made it. Here it is. I am doing my doctoral program. I have a master's degree. I taught high school. I did it and so can you. Do not let anybody put you down. And then I told them about my experience with a relative. My mother, in talking with this relative, the relative said to my mother that I, Melita, did not have head for books. So I had a little talk with my father in heaven and I said, you give me a brain and I can use this brain and achieve. You working with me, we can work together and make this happen. And so this relative lived long enough to see that I not only have head for books, but I have head to write books. Well, that sold it for the students. And do you know 
that once the students were taught about these basic functions of the brain and how it works and how we can now transfer information from short term to long term and apply ourselves that once we have healthy brains and that we are not retards that all of us have the ability it's a matter of opportunities it's a matter of what we say to ourselves when we change our self-talk what we say to ourselves and our attitudes change and we are now thinking positive that we can accomplish great things those students at the end of the experiment using brain-based learning strategies the teacher will use strategies considering the functioning of the brain and implementing those strategies to help students learn and remember the students themselves learn the functioning just the basic things i taught them about the emotional brain that hippocampus there and the importance of sleep wake the importance of feeding their bodies properly and those students at the end of eight sessions in one month their grades improved by 12.5 percent the same as the students in the prestige school that was amazing it just goes to show that when we do extra work with our students and engage them in this way that um, regardless of uh, the students abilities we will see great improvement if you think your students are doing well now then they will have photographic memories and uh, have more time now for extracurricular activities there is uh, so much that can be said about extracurricular activities because these provide opportunities for emotional and social development these are important for the emotional brain because we develop our emotions our feelings the positive ones from the people in our environment with whom we have social relationships therefore it's important for us to look at that positive attitude says that i can and then self-talk is uh, the words that we say concerning the importance of study and our abilities to do so with help if it uh, becomes necessary so it's those words that we say to ourselves so many times we sabotage our abilities by saying negative words an example for me was i cannot do biology well i kept saying that until god placed in my mind a special interest in the brain and how it functions to understand the brain and how it functions i had to understand some biology because of that i know how to change my thinking i started saying to myself god is the one who gives us the brain he's the one who inspires the memory with my efforts and so i must think that he who put this interest in my mind is able to help me understand and remember biology it took a little bit of convincing my brain because it does not happen overnight over time about two or three weeks things began to kick in and i started understanding biology now many of you have heard how i'm able to explain different parts of the body system and so on our self-talk is important for us to consider when we sit down to study we should do pre-study relaxation this is via deep breathing 
relaxing and listening to classical music before studying. I remember going to schools, doing work with teachers. I noticed how restless the students were on an afternoon after lunch. And on a morning when they came in, because they may have heard their parents quarreling and fighting before leaving home, on their way, in the taxi, in the maxi taxi, the bus, they've been hearing music with negative lyrics. They may have seen fighting in their communities, gunshots, they may have heard those. They come to school agitated. When the school now implemented this strategy that I suggested to play classical music, it created a whole different environment in the school. What the principals did in these schools was that they played classical music over the PA system so that every classroom heard it at the same time and the whole school pretty much settled down into study. The teachers and parents consider your electromagnetic field and now this is for face-to-face -face teaching. Your electromagnetic field it is said of our bodies is that we are electrical, especially looking at the heart is electrical in nature. For COVID-19, we were told to stay six feet apart. Now, there's something interesting about six feet apart. We noticed it was not four feet, five feet, but six feet. And that was because it was to keep us emotionally disconnected. This electromagnetic field, it exudes five feet around us. It's a five foot radius. So that whatever I'm experiencing, my excitement, my motivation and drive, anybody next to me within that five foot radius, going to feel that this is what motivational speakers use and so they work on the people's feelings and that electrical vibration going out from the speaker's body to the person's closest and then it spreads throughout for hundreds or even thousands of persons this electromagnetic field that we have in this five foot radius is also dependent on one of the neurotransmitters and that is oxytocin, that love trust hormone. When we show love and care, trust in the classroom, teacher to students, students with each other and students back to the teacher, then what we have is an environment, a classroom environment that um, encourages learning. This is uh, what we want to experience in our classroom. So consider this electromagnetic field and that if you are sad and discouraged, you have problems from your home and you've come into the classroom with it, your students are going to pick up what is going on with you and lash out. They have no idea what is going on, but they're going to sense it and respond to you accordingly. Before you get to the classroom or parents, before you start teaching your children in the evening or whenever it is, first get into a good frame of mind emotionally. Make sure you're emotionally charged with positive thoughts and feelings so that you can transmit that to the ones you are teaching. The brain has a time clock. The brain cannot keep going on and on and on. 
I've seen in classrooms where teachers want to just keep teaching new information right down to the end of the class period. That way the children do not remember much at all. The brain has a time clock and that time clock is dependent on different things that are important for learning. There is an automatic on and off switch in the brain. We must not take it for granted that we can just keep teaching on and on. What is the concentration time for study? That's the question. Is it one hour, two hours, 15 minutes, 30 minutes? How long? Well, how long is that concentration time for the brain's time clock? is dependent on age, the age of the person's teaching or studying, the developmental stage. That developmental stage may be quite different from age. It depends on how students are socialized, how they have been taught. Then you have natural abilities. If you're teaching math, a student has natural ability for math, then the time clock can move from 15 minutes to an hour or two hours. If you have autistic children with abilities to music, they can go on. You have a five or six year old could stay at an instrument for an hour, two hours and never be distracted. You have the student's interest. Is the student really interested in what you're teaching? Now you as a teacher or the parent could help the child to become interested in the subject area. The teaching methods. Are you teaching and just giving information or are you using drama? You're using poetry, using music, storytelling. You can never go wrong with storytelling. Then the environmental factors. What is going on in the environment? Are there things that distract the students? If there are, then the brain time clock will switch off quickly. Another area of interest, which we have discussed even up to our last session, we talk about the brain gut connection. Because of the brain is connected to the gut, whatever we eat, the nutrition goes to the brain, especially that emotional brain we're talking about here, and provides the necessary nutrients for the brain to function. Some of the foods that we need and to look at, one, we need to increase green foods, especially our spinach, kale, broccoli, watercress, moringa. We can use all or one or two of these on a regular basis, depending on your financial situations. But definitely include green foods to help with the brain. The cereals should not have any sugar in them at all. If you're using any sweetener, let it be natural sweet because the brain does need glucose and it needs to get the glucose from natural foods and not from artificial sweeteners. You need nuts and seeds and the omega-3s which you are going to get from your chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, that's a nut that shapes like a brain and of course you're going to get it from your seaweeds your irish moss chlorella spirulina those are green algae and uh, you get nutrients from alfalfa and kelp use these and these will help with the brain and the gut now finally i must leave with you my special strategy i call it the files strategy now i hope that the children here will remember files f-i-l-e-s now parents you can encourage your children or grandchildren to say this 
with you even while we are doing it files f-i-l-e-s files f-i-l-e-s f F is for focus i for image l for link e for emotions and s for senses now we need to understand each of these to help us remember what we learn now the first one is focus when we are focusing on anything we need to pay special attention we need to read aloud where possible in so doing we are able to focus on what we are studying we need to stop do some deep breathing and really pay attention the next thing is to create those images in the mind that we talk about the l is for link link the new information with something you know already or some experience that you had some event that took place the e is for emotions think about how you feel or felt during the learning of this bit of information put the feelings with the information and then think about the senses that were involved what you heard what you saw even what you said or what you tasted what you smelt or what you have actually hands-on experience and this is where kinesthetic learning comes in kinesthetic has to do with hands-on and movement exercise is key even in my experiment i had all the furniture in the classroom away from the periphery of the classroom so that part the outer edge of the classroom was clear and i had students running around and then doing a few squats i tell i tell them freeze and at the point when they froze i slipped in a little concept there and then had them run around freeze repeated the concept run again do some squats freeze and um taught them something else added to the first concept at the end of that class session the students from both schools both ends of the spectrum they got it they did not have to go home and try to learn it they learned it right in the classroom it reduces teaching time and it makes it fun for both teacher and students exercise is important because exercise helps to grow the hippocampus where we have long-term memory exercise 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 we cannot overemphasize the importance of movement then senses having the students be able to experience whether it is in a lab or if it is in a practical activity it may be gardening in the school ground it may be playing a game it may be storytelling or whatever it is where the senses are involved in storytelling you can create the sense you can have the students imagine the different senses and that it's actually smelling or they're hearing and tasting and so on this is the files strategy that can be explained this way focus on the image that f and i and link it the image and the information to the emotions and the senses so that's the first strategy here that i leave with you now this is just the basics for improving learning and memory and i thought i'll share this much with you this evening so that you can benefit and have something to work on with 
yourselves, your students, your children, and other persons you may be trying to help in terms of learning and memory. Now you have opportunity to ask your questions and give your comments. I hope you notice in the background that music is just soft. You can barely hear it. I hope you can barely hear it, but it's there and it is really encouraging the student to learn. And uh, there are no words, only instruments, and it's as though you are either by a river or a beach, waterfalls, you have the water running, the birds singing, such as the instrument in the background, just soothing to encourage and to foster learning and memory. Yes, it is open for you to ask your questions or give your comments. Good night, Dr. Sentil. Yes, hi, good night. The presentation has been an excellent presentation. And as an educator myself, as I listen, I was saying what that our teachers would understand what has been shared here tonight in terms of brain, brain Brain, based learning, brain based learning in terms of memory strategies and all that has been has been said and i would hope that this recording would you know go far and wide because a number of students are shortchanged i must say uh, in terms of they being able to develop because what we have um, give to us as students with the raw material, students who have the ability, but then we have to help them create the product as it will. So, um, you know, I really enjoyed the session and I wish far and by parents, teachers, and many more. Well, Thank you and praise the Lord for that. You know, one time I visited a school right in my area that I lived and I was appalled to see the teacher teaching students who were 10 years old and just repeating over and over the same thing. The students were not getting it. The students were just there seated behind a desk and no matter what she said, the students did not get it. And I felt, I, I, I felt lost and hopeless in that there because I could not step in to help. And what was necessary was for the teacher to ask the students, get up, you know, giggle, laugh, talk a little bit, have some fun. And then when they come back, it would be so much easier for the student to understand the same thing that was taught. I saw it even in secondary school in my classes. I had students talking and laughing, having fun, to the extent that it, it was said by one principal that all I was doing was all talking. But the results showed differently when the students wrote exams. Uh, they got the ones and twos in, in the subject area. And that is because of that environment in the classroom uh, that, that the students were not seated stiff behind desk. I also teaching students about uh, their diet and how to change uh, to stop buying these soft drinks and so on, use a banana and apple instead, makes a huge difference in the student's ability. And I remember one of my friends uh, did a, a workshop for children. And of course I was involved in, in that with her. Uh, she had 
as a snack box for them before they left and it had she gave them in fact they ate it there in the session and it had a sandwich with spinach now these young people they did not eat spinach period but guess what because they were eating it in company <laughs> they all ate it and liked it it is amazing how children can change their taste buds in a flash and begin to like things i saw it even as a pathfinder director parents warned me that their children do not eat pumpkin and do not eat this and that i'm like okay no problem and on the camp i cook the same things the parents that the children do not eat and you know what they ate and came back for seconds so that the things that we feel our children will never eat they will eat if we encourage them get them involved in the preparation and tell them that their brain will be sharper tell them that they will spend less time doing schoolwork and have more time for fun and you will see tremendous differences in the way they perform okay good evening i would just like to make a comment um also maybe to seek some assistance um i'm a, a parent and um and um some of the the strategies that you presented here um this evening i definitely will implement it with my son especially because he um what i notice is that he's easily distracted you know he's not able to focus for any long span of time on things mm -hmm. but then as you would have said sometimes we need to get our children moving in yeah. order for them to learn you know and some children can't sit still right mm -hmm. and i think um some of the strategies that you mentioned can work for him in terms of getting him you know other ways to retain information and so forth to learn yeah. you know but make it fun for them so i am yeah. very grateful you know that i was able to attend this session and I look forward to whatever else, you know, information that I can gather in order to help, you know, not just my children alone, but even myself. Yes, you know, of course, it's I for can, all of us. Yeah, yeah, even in my own Bible studies and so to remember, yes, you course. know, your memory verse and all of these things, we can implement it on ourselves. Yes, and next so week, God willing, we will have part two. Okay, thanks much. Yes, and uh, let me tell you this, I, I did not know some of these things, but uh, uh, God gifts us uh, with uh, special talents, right? Uh, one of mine, I think I was actually born with is teaching. I can teach anything that I understand. And I visited a friend of mine. She had her son as a five, six year old going to school and uh, i would pass the day on an afternoon he had his spelling to learn and i would take him up in his spelling while she was out doing other things and his words i remember some of them were breakfast words i created a story of a, a little boy just like him who was given breakfast and for breakfast, he had bread, B-R-E-A-D. And he was running around and saying B-R-E-A-D. And you think that he was not learning anything. And then when it cheese, C-H-E-E-S-E, -E -E, and he was just having a blast, laughing and giggling about the storyline that was given to him. Then my friend came out one, of, one day and she said, all I'm hearing is talking and laughing, but uh, is, uh, is he learning anything? And I said, well, you check, you ask him how to spell these words. And she was amazed. 
that he could spell everyone correctly. The next day he went to school and did that spelling test. He just breathed through, got all of them correctly. Just adding that fun and interest for the students, having them move around, especially boys, uh, it's important to implement those kinds of strategies. Just uh, telling your children that you believe in them, that you know that they can do well, makes a great difference in their lives. You may have read about famous people, but I know in my teachings, I had a student, <laughs> uh, the student failed exams, all the subject areas in high school. The teachers literally laughed at the students. And I said, there is no way I'm going to encourage that. So I talked with that student and got the student to change his whole mindset, let him know that I'm there to support him. And another teacher did the same thing and would you believe after the first term after we started this he went from the bottom of the class to the first two in the, about three subjects that the other teacher and myself taught him and i'm telling you this is so important that we encourage our students and let them know that they do have the ability and that we are there to support them.